let's take a look now at some uh, X-linked traits here. The first is uh, one that's, that's uh, fairly common in males, uh, but rare in females, and that is uh, color blindness. Uh, just to review, an X-linked gene is a gene that uh, is on the X chromosome but doesn't have a homologue on the Y. So males are going to be hemizygous, which means they only takes whatever gene they have it will be fully expressed. Uh, here's a, a type of test called the Hishihara test for color blindness. And, and hopefully what you can see, unless you're colorblind, is you can see the, the number 7 here, number 42, 10, and 2. Um, let me show you how this is inherited. Uh, first of all, uh, the dominant allele, as you can see right here, is actually uh, the normal allele, and the recessive allele is the colorblind allele. So what I've done here is take a female who's homozygous normal and crossed her with a male who is colorblind. Now what you can see is that the female is going to, in every case, she's going to pass uh, an X dominant on to her offspring, which means every offspring from this cross is going to have normal vision. So here's a daughter, daughter, son, son. You can see that they're all normal. The, the father passes a Y on half the time, so his, he has two sons, each of which are, have normal vision. But you'll notice that since he's passing on his colorblind gene to each of his daughters, each of his daughters here are carriers. If this son right here marries a woman who's homozygous dominant for normal vision, all of their children will be normal, and that gene will have dropped out of this part of the pedigree. Uh, now, we can continue this here, though. Both daughters here are, uh, are carriers. So if they marry men who do not have colorblindness, then you can see what happens here. Uh, half the time, the daughters give an X dominant. Half the time, they give an X recessive. The father always gets an X, an X dominant, which means that uh, one of the daughters will be a normal, not a carrier. The other daughter will be a carrier. Notice also that uh, half the sons will have the disease and half the sons will not have the disease. So this is a, this is a pattern that's typical of uh, X-linked trait and that is that it appears to, to skip generations. You can see here I put a red arrow to indicate all the individuals that actually express this trait, color blindness, and uh, what you'll find is that, that there's, there are no individuals in this second generation that actually have it. So skipping generations uh, is something that does happen. However, it doesn't mean you can't have colorblind females. Uh, you can see that if we have a man who's colorblind and he marries a woman who's a carrier, uh, the man always gives a colorblind gene, the woman half the time gets a colorblind gene, so half of her daughters will be colorblind. So there's your colorblind daughter. The other half will be carriers. And then, of course, if you get the X dominant with a Y, you get that son. If you get the X recessive with that um, uh, organism, you get that son. And notice in this particular case, because we started at a different place, we didn't skip a generation. So you can't always depend on, on, on that. Uh, there's another um, type of uh, excellent gene here called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, when you open the SmartBoard notebook, if you want to, you can click on that little globe right there, and it will give you some uh, information on this one. But once again, these these X-linked genes are, are generally uh, fairly rare in females because you would have to have a male that has a disease uh, marry a female who who uh, is at least a carrier to to have a female that had that showed the disease. All right, so let's let's look at something else here. Uh, when Morgan's lab in Columbia University was looking at these, these genes, they, they found the uh, X-linked genes first, but then uh, because of the work of Sutton, they knew that there were many, many genes on the chromosome. So they started doing a series of crosses looking for genes that were, that were linked but weren't on sex chromosomes. So they were on the autosome. So let's look, first of all, at what we, we had done previously. The assumption we made and that Mendel made was that the genes uh, in, uh, assorted independently. And you can see that would mean that the A a gene here is on a separate chromosome from the B gene. And uh, you've already done this cross before, but just to go through it briefly, you have a homozygous dominant A, homozygous dominant B, cross with homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive, and all of your F1s are going to be a heterozygous. So they'll both show, they'll show both uh, normal traits. Now what Morgan's team decided to do was in the F, was the next thing to do was to do a back cross. Let me go back. They actually took this organism right here and they crossed it back to this organism right here, which is, again, a test cross, because in a test cross, you're always crossing with a homozygous recessive. And when they did that, what they got out, what they got was a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio. And uh, you can work this out, uh, where you got uh, one-fourth showed dominant for A, dominant for B. One-fourth showed dominant for A, recessive for B. One-fourth showed recessive for A, dominant for B. And the uh, one-fourth showed both recessives. So that, that's what happens if the genes are on separate chromosomes. But what if the genes are actually on the same chromosome? So that looks like this. So in this particular case, you can see that I've linked the A gene here with the, with the B gene. So 
what gets inherited are actually not the individual genes, as you know, but it's actually the chromosomes. So this cross looks exactly the same. You have a homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant, cross with homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive. You can see down here, we get one of these chromosomes up here, you get one of these chromosomes here, and you end up with the double uh, heterozygote. Again, you see dominant for both traits. Where, where this gets interesting, though, is what happens when you do the, the, the test cross. So you take the double heterozygote and you cross it back with the double homozygous recessive. What you'll notice is, half the time, this organism gives the dominant A, dominant B, linked with recessive A, recessive B. That's the only allele or chromosome this organism can give. And so you get dominant, dominant. If you take the second chromosome here and link it with one of these, then you get recessive, recessive. And what's missing are the dominant recessives and the recessive dominance. So this is what Morgan's team was looking for. They were looking for either getting all four phenotypes in equal proportion or missing some of the phenotypes. And if they got all four, then they realized the genes were on uh, the different chromosomes. If they just got the dominant, dominant, and the recessive, recessive, they realized they were on the same chromosome. So, so let's look at an, extra, an actual cross here. So, uh, so here's what they did. Uh, they took a, a wild-type fruit fly, which was a gray body, normal wings. That's dominant, dominant. That's what the, the plus here means is dominant. They cross it with a double mutant, which is the black vestigial. Um, that would be homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive. And, of course, in the F1, they got heterozygous, heterozygous. Then they did a test cross with this, again, crossing the F1s back with the original strain, which was the uh, black body vestigial wings. And what they got out of this was the following data. And you can see their data is a little bit weird because while the majority of the flies did show dominant for both traits or recessive for both traits, they still got this little group of flies that seemed to come up with something that's impossible. Uh, how is it possible that you could actually end up with um, dominant recessives and recessive dominance, which is what these guys are right here? Uh, that mystery was actually, uh, was actually solved and uh, because what they realized was happening was that some sort of recombination was occurring. Uh, and, of course, that recombination is a result, result of, of crossing over. So let's go back and look at that, that cross one more time here. If we assume a crossing over event occurs, let me pick a pen here. If we assume a crossing over event occurs here, then what happens is this becomes the recessive A and this becomes the dominant A. So now what happens is when I take this chromosome with one of these, I get homozygous recessive heterozygous, which is my dominant recessive. When I take this chromosome with one of these, I get um, heterozygous for A, homozygous recessive B. So crossing over actually creates the dominant recessives and the recessive dominance. And notice that one single crossover event right here actually created both recombinants, which is why the recombinants appear to be in, uh, in equal proportion. Now go back and look at the, the data from the Morgan experiment here again. And what you'll notice is that they had about 950 dominant dominants, about 950 uh, dominant recess, uh, recessive recessives, and about 200 each of the dominant recessive and recessive dominants. And these guys are the, the, the recombinants. Notice, if you will, that in this particular case, these guys are also called the non-parental types because, remember, the original cross, what you had was you had uh, gray normal with black vestigial, and so you get gray normal with black vestigial, but the recombinants are the, the non-parental the non types. And by the way, just as a, a trick here to work these types of problems, uh, the recombinants are always the lower numbers. This young man right here, Alfred Sturdivant, also working in Morgan's lab, was actually one of uh, Morgan's students, came up with an ingenious idea, and that is the fact that he noticed that in different dihybrid crosses, the recombination rate differed. And so that meant to him, and it turned out to be true, that the closer two genes are together, the less likely any single crossover event is to separate them. And the farther apart they are, the more likely that is to occur. And you can actually calculate this recombination rate by taking the total number of recombinant offspring and dividing that by the total number of offspring. And he assigned this 1% recombination rate as, as one MAP unit. Okay? So crossover rates are determined by looking at dihybrid crosses or trihybrid crosses is what we did again. We took the homozygous dominant, homozygous dominant with homozygous recessive, homozygous recessive, got the double heterozygote, did a back cross, a test cross. If we get the one-to-one-to-one-to-one, -to -one -to -one -to -one, then you've got genes on different chromosomes. If you get one-to-one -one with, with smaller numbers of the recombinants, then the genes are on the same chromosome. They're linked, okay? A couple things here. Crossover event uh, simultaneously generates both dominant recessive and recessive dominant, so they're going to be about in equal numbers. With diver crosses, can only detect uh, locations of genes that are 
that are closer than 50 map units. If they're farther away than that, they're gonna the, the numbers you're gonna get are gonna look like they're not linked. And uh, we'll talk about this uh, more in class.